right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining me this Thursday evening. I hope you guys are having a, a great day and a great week. My name is Garrett McLaughlin. In the webinar today, we're going to cover six foundational movement patterns for runners and how to strengthen them. Um, in my opinion, this is a, a fantastic topic. If you're someone that's looking to add strength training for the first time, um, really kind of redefine how you incorporate strength training alongside your running, uh, or you're just looking for ways to to do things better, really. I think this is a, a very simple system, um, not easy, but a, a simple system and blueprint that you can follow to see really great results from an injury, um, but also potentially from an injury prevention, injury rehabilitation standpoint. Before we get started, do me a favor and, and silence any technology around you. I really want to make sure you get the most from the content today. If you can look around your screen, um, whether you're on the cell phone, tablet, or computer, try to locate that Q&A button. Um, the Q&A button is a way for you to ask questions, provide feedback, comment, and interact directly with me throughout the webinar. If you have any questions right now before we get started, you're welcome to, to drop a line in there, and I'll make sure to intertwine that within the webinar. Uh, if not, it'll be something that I'll, I'll try to do my best to answer in the Q&A or connect with you directly if it's not perfectly uh, aligned with the material. Um, since I know we sometimes people drop questions just running related, I want to make sure I answer those for you if possible. At the very end of the webinar, I will be raffling off one entry into the, the new, this is a brand new program, the Fundamentals of Strength Training Program. So this program is super cool, in my opinion. Uh, it's a four-week program. It is an individualized program. So each person has their own specific strength training program, can completely tailor to your goals, your needs, upcoming races, and what have you. Um, but it's almost executed in, in, in a group format. So you'll be working on your program individually. You'll have accountability. You'll have education. You'll have interaction within the Facebook group, um, chance to win prizes, and uh, different raffle items, uh, strength training, swag, running swag, some cool things over the four week period of time working together. Um, you can also add on depending on your needs. I, I wanted to lay out three different tiers to make sure you got exactly what you needed from it. I didn't pigeon you hold, pigeonhole you into something specifically. So you can add on running analysis, a custom running plan, one on one training sessions. There's a lot of ways to really get the most from this program. And I think it would be truly effective for you. So I will be raffling off one free entry into that program, which at the end of the webinar, I'll be asking you to enter your name if you're interested. Um, if you don't win, and you're not the lucky winner. Unfortunately, um, you still can join the program. I only have 10 spots available. I'm going to try to really cap this, keep this small to add as much value as possible. Um, and I'll share that link with you at, at some point just to make sure you can look into the program, see if it's a fit for you. Because I think with how individualized it is to each and every person in the program, um, you can see tremendous goal, tremendous results regardless of your goals. If you cannot stay for the entire webinar for whatever reason, I completely understand. I will be sending the, the replay of the webinar tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Um, this will also include the winner of the raffle. So if you're entering into the raffle, you need to check that email to see if you're the winner. If not, I will move on to that next person. Um, check your spam folder. It sometimes ends up in there, but just be aware tomorrow at 11 a.m. Expect an email from me in your inbox. Okay, so what to expect from the webinar today? We're going to start talking about the demands of running on the body and why strength training matters. A lot of times people are, are adding strength training just because they assume it's needed, but don't really know why it's needed. So we're going to talk about how running actually challenges the body and then what we can do from a strength training standpoint to actually uh, target ourselves, target the body in a correct way to see the most sustainable results moving forward. Um, I'm going to kind of explain a, a specific system, uh, six foundational movement patterns, kind of created by Dan John, who's a, 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 a strength and conditioning coach in the United States, how to use this system to better categorize your strength training program. So you have a very simple, almost plug and play method to follow the most um, successful strength training program for you. And I actually show you some exercises that you can put into each category. Um, pretty much rinse, repeat, continue to refine your program. This is a system that can continue to be used um, for really years and years to come without getting outdated in any way. And like I said, at the very end, we'll raffle off one free entry into the new Fundamentals of Strength Training Program. Before we get started into the content, let me introduce myself. My name is Garrett McLaughlin. I'm a licensed athletic trainer and strength conditioning coach. I currently see clients in West Bloomfield, Michigan. So all my shout out to all my uh, Southeast Michigan people, um, but also virtually as well. Uh, fortunately, again, not just through COVID, but 
uh, technology, right? Just being able to see people regardless of location. So within the healthy running program, work with runners that want to get faster and move better, recover from injury and improve longevity, which I think is the most important thing within the sport of running. Now, as we get into the content, I want to start talking about running first specifically. And what are the demands of running actually on the human body? And strength training is helpful for running, but we need to understand how and why to apply it. So running is a, is a very single leg plyometric like activity. You are literally on a single leg bounding from one leg to the next um, because it's a very repetitive and predictable movement pattern, right? You're doing that same motion over and over again for, for minutes and hours and miles and, and days and weeks and years. So because it's very predictable, uh, there's been so much research done on the, the, the movement pattern of running to understand the mechanics, the range of motion, all the different things that go into it. So that means from a strength training standpoint, we can use that information. We can use that research to really fuel our strength training program to understand what are those specific things we want to, there's specific areas we want to target to be a more effective and efficient runner. A lot of times people are doing things just to do things, assuming, hey, if I just get stronger, I'm going to be a better runner. But understand, again, you need to be strong and stable on a single leg. You need to be powerful and able to bound from one leg to the next. Um, we want to be efficient. We want to be economical. There's a lot of things that go into proper running. And these are the things that need to really be a part of our strength training program. What's interesting and, and a big piece that a lot of people don't understand is as you run and literally strike the ground, there's up to two to six times your body weight coming down on a single leg. So if I just think about myself, if I do a quick calculation here, so 1,140 pounds for me on the high side, right? If that's six times my body weight. Now don't, don't go ahead and reverse that to see, to see what my, uh, my body weight is, but imagine that much force coming down on a single leg every time you strike the ground. So why that matters is as we age in every decade of life, we start to lose bone mineral density. We start to lose muscle mass, muscle strength, power. Um, people are always wonder why they start to run into injuries at a certain period of time is because if they're not maintaining their overall health, physique, strength, uh, bone density, and those things, we're actually loading the same degree but in a weakened state. So we use strength training to help combat that, especially as we start to get older, uh, as we start to run faster, as we incorporate speed work and make, make our training more demanding, or we, we go from a half marathon to a full marathon or ultra marathon. Strength training is really that foundational strategy to really bridge the gap to make sure we can do that successfully. Um, from a, a running standpoint, some of the key characteristics we want to train our power, right? Power is that explosiveness of that rate of force development as we push off and explode from one leg to the next. Uh, strength, strength is the just the capacity to load a tissue, right? So um, I like to think of this, I mean, every time you strike the ground, depending on how hard you're hitting the ground, we're loading that tissue to a certain degree. The stronger that tissue is, the more it's able to withstand those forces. That's where strength comes in. Endurance is obviously the repetitiveness over an extended period of time. So if you're running half marathon, full marathon, ultra marathon, endurance, cardiovascular fitness, muscular endurance, all those things really come into play quite a bit. And then stability and balance are huge. And I think often overlooked from a running standpoint, we don't want to just be strong and be powerful. We want to be uh, almost like a, a ninja on a single leg, right? We want to be able to land and, and to be stable and to control our body weight in space, to have that proprioception, that neuromuscular control and that balance, because uh, that really translates over to, to good efficiency and movement. Now, all of this needs to be done while withstanding the repetitive loads, 1,140 pounds of, of force coming down on the leg for me um, on that single leg, right? So a lot of things need to happen at the right time while actually doing it on, on one leg. Now, if you're a geek like me and you, you look into the research uh, a little bit deeper, there's so much that we can use to our advantage. And this is what I use to really craft the strength training programs, looking at ground reaction forces, like I mentioned a second ago, and how much are we striking and, and hitting the ground at what point, what tissues do we need to make strong at what point throughout that running cycle? Um, 
as we run faster, what muscles are we actually loading to a greater degree? We know from a, a slow jogging pace to a faster pace, if we're going to incorporate speed work, we know the amount of stress on the calf, the hamstring and the hip flexor in particular are going to jump up significantly. So just based on someone's training alone, if I'm creating someone's training plan, right, we're training for half marathon. This is our 16 week plan. We're going to start incorporating speed work here. This is what it's going to look like. These are your paces. I know two months before we better start preparing that tissue to withstand the demands of that training. So we look at the big picture, the running plan and the strength training to get all of these pieces to fit together. So you're successful. Um, then also other things like range of motion, again, what, what joints, uh, what muscles do we actually need to have proper range of motion? It's a lot less than we, we tend to think you don't need to be super flexible to, to actually run the ankles, hips, and, and big toe or, or, or the, most common areas, um, but those are some, some of the things we look at. We make sure we really take into um, when designing our strength training programs. Now, do runners need to strength train? Um, usually, yes, right? There, there are some people that can get away with not strength training, and, and I know and talk with plenty of people all the time that say, hey, I don't do this. I have no issues. I run well. I continue to see great results, and it's not part of my routine. That's good. Um, the, the injury rates from a running standpoint are very high with 60 to 80% of all runners are getting injured each and every year, or have something that has to something that actually temporarily sidelines them from running. So I like to use strength training as an insurance policy, right? Can we build or just preserve the foundation of our body? Um, just to not break down over time with just this repetitive load and repetitive demand on the system. So using strength training as a way to improve bone, muscle, tendon, and joint health and bone and tendons specifically uh, are really the most important there since very prevalent common uh, overuse injuries for running. Uh, but then using strength training to increase power, strength, endurance, and stabilization. Um, I don't want you just to run with your natural ability, just, just what you have. Uh, I want you to and cheat in a way, right? Let's use strength training as a way to build up these areas so we can actually be more successful once we get out there on the road or the trail. Everyone's always looking for running speed, running economy, right? Just to see better performance, achieve a PR. That's something most people are, are, are chasing, which becomes harder as we age. Since we said every decade of life, our body tends to, tends to decline to a certain degree unless we're actually addressing that uh, with some type of program. Um, and then Really importantly, address weak links, the risk factors associated with injury. We know through the research what the common areas uh, that can become injured are. So in our strength training program, can we directly strengthen? Can we stabilize? Can we target those areas in a smart way? So we are less likely to become injured. You are never going to eliminate your risk of injury. Uh, every time people sign up for the webinars, people always say, how do I avoid injury? How do I prevent injury? It's impossible. It's, injury is going to happen at some point, and we need to accept that. But if we can do the right thing here, the setbacks of those injuries are significantly less. I just had a woman not too long ago, uh, history of lower back issues. She had a flare-up as she was training for her, her marathon three days, maybe this time. And she said it used to take her weeks to a month to get back from this. It took her three days. Um, she'd been doing strength training for about two, three months. And we didn't fix her problem yet. It's going to take a while to really get to that level. Um, but the de degree to which it set her back was significantly less because she was putting in the work behind the scenes so she could bounce back that much more quickly. And then I think one of the more important things, be a well-functioning human being in daily life. Um, looking beyond running, right? Running is great. Uh, but you know, what is your identity outside of running? There's a lot more to who we are than, than just runners. So are you a mother, a father, a son or a daughter, grandparent? Are you chasing your grandkids around? Are you um, gardening? Are you doing stuff with friends? Are you going on vacation, hiking? Um, there's a lot of different things that we, that we need to preserve as we get older in life, just to live in a, in a, healthy, in a healthy way. So let's make sure we intertwine a lot of those pieces in there as well. So what I want to do is introduce a quick little poll here. I always like to add some of these questions into the webinar. Uh, one thing I'm realizing I didn't I didn't say specifically right now, but I'm going to ask this because it's a pretty pretty simple question. But just to see who's paying attention, who uh, strolled off to get dinner, or is maybe watching. What time is it? Watching Wheel of Fortune right now, maybe. But question number one: While running, the body experience is up to how many times your body weight and force? Is it two, four, six? Two: The fastest way to improve performance and reduce your likelihood of injury is to complete the most. Is it individualized or general? That should be pretty common. Um, just those two questions right there. 
If you do not see this on your screen, you may be accessing the webinar in some way where it's not compatible. So don't worry about the poll. It's there. People are filling it out. Uh, we're going to wait to see if we can get 80% of people to fill out these questions. It's ticking up right now. 60% done. 66. Just to see how well you guys are paying attention. And then we'll kind of get into the main, the meat of the content today with the, the, the six foundational movement patterns. 80%. 86. All right, I'm going to close it down here. So just to quickly review, while running, the body experience is up to how many times your body weight and force. That's the, that's the clue right there. It's up to six times. It's two to six times your body weight. So all of those are technically correct. But on the high end, it's typically around six. And that's kind of a, um, again, it's a, it's, it's a rough number. It could be more, it could be less to a degree, but that's kind of the average that we're seeing through the research. The fastest way to improve performance and reduce likelihood of injury is to complete the most individualized program possible, 100% right there. Um, obviously, the more specific you are to your needs, the more you can individualize something to what you need, the faster and more reliable the results. Um, that's also a funny thing. I was talking to a woman the other day, and she, as she's preparing for this race saying like, does this need to be harder? Like, do we need to do more? I'm like, no, like just, just give it time, be consistent. Two months go by, three months go by, um, getting to the point race is coming up in a month. And she's like, I'm surprised at how good I feel. Like, I feel like I, I should have done so much more, but I'm realizing that as a more specific to what I need, as opposed to just generally strengthening things, the results are like, it's exponential, the difference that she feels. Um, and that's just the individualization piece of it. Now, six foundational movement patterns. So this right here is something I, I stole, as I do for, for most things, since there's everyone out there is, is smarter and has, has already done things. You pretty much just, just take from people, give them credit, and, and try to craft it to your audience as much as possible. Um, Dan John, who, I, who like I mentioned in the introduction, is a strength conditioning coach here in the United States. Uh, very smart guy, a lot of, lot of good educational content, a lot of books. Uh, I've seen him speak publicly a few times and, and just uh, as a good way of conveying this information in a very simple way. So he said, I said it was simple, not easy. Uh, and this is his system specifically. So what one thing, and like what I mentioned with that woman a second ago, it's actually very easy to incorporate the strength training piece. We, we tend to overcomplicate it quite a bit. We think, uh, I think nowadays things need to be harder than they are or they need to be fancy or, or complicated or trendy or whatever. It, it's actually very simple and boring to a degree. It's, it's laying out a series of exercises that fit you and you do a an, running analysis, you do an evaluation, you lay out the exercise that are more specific to your needs and your goals. You continue to tweak those dials and progress those exercises and change and, and, and adjust those as you get closer to your goal race, making sure you respect your running mileage. It's more so about doing the consistent things in a very, um, a repetitive way over a long period of time to see results as opposed to getting fancy. A lot of people get fancy. They only do things for a short period of time and, and say, Hey, it doesn't work. Uh, we need a, we need an extended period of time to really see the results from strength training. So the six foundational movement patterns that Dan John kind of outlines here are, and we'll dig into each one of these specifically and show you exercises within each category, carry, squat, hinge, push, pull, and everything else, right? So you'll see these are specific uh, buckets, if you will, right? So we can say, I like to think that's almost like the, the silverware drawer, right? You, everyone in their silverware drawer, you, you have our knives, we have our forks, we have our spoons, we have our small forks, we have, uh, might have the little corn holders, right? We have all these different things within the, um, within the silverware drawer. They all have their different place within there. So we don't have to go in and think, oh, shoot, like, what do I need? Like, where does this go? It's already outlined for us in a way. So this right here, the six movements is our silverware drawer. And we're going to add the forks, the knives, the different styles of those, the different textures and sharpness and all that stuff in there to fit our needs. And those are the specific exercises. Now, carry is the first one. This is and what they tend to say is the easiest way to start seeing results since you're most likely not doing it, right? No one is doing some type of loaded carry, which is holding a, a nice heavy pair of weights, could be a pair of dumbbells, could be a pair of kettlebells, uh, could be a sandbag, could be doing something and holding that as you walk down and back. There's obviously different variations as we'll show here, but in its simplest form, these are farmer's walks, which are, again, heavy pair of weights, 
slow controlled motion down. I'm, all I'm trying to focus on is, is tall spine, good posture, core is engaged, nice stable movement. Those dumbbells in my hand right now aren't super heavy just for demonstration purposes, but a lot of women that I work with can hold anywhere from 30 to 45 pounds in each hand. A lot of men are 60 to 80, but as you hold that heavy pair of dumbbells, it provides this or creates this sway side to side. So all of your muscles, your postural stabilizers, your core stabilizers, hip, foot, all of these muscles have to work hard to make sure you are walking in a nice straight line going forward. That is obviously more challenging, right? It starts pulling you to the side as you hold a single dumbbell with something like the, the suitcase carry. So if you're looking for something upright that works on posture, that works on core stability, um, stabilization of the, the foot, the hip, the pelvis, and tying all these things together. Most people from a core training standpoint are doing a lot of exercises, kind of rolling on the ground in that traditional core, uh, sit-ups, crunches, supermans. And those are, those are good. We can target some of those individual areas, but when you think about running, running is upright, it's dynamic, it's, it's posture, it's core, it's stability in a dynamic and changing environment. And that's what you get with some of these uh, carry or loaded carry variations. One of my favorite one is two dumbbell marching. Now we think about running, right? We're on a single leg. We're holding a heavy pair of dumbbells. They're trying to pull us side to side, but as we have to really withstand that pull as we're stabilizing there on a single leg. So pelvic control, foot stability, core stability, all of those things happening at once. Um, great exercise. Something I have a, a lot of people do, um, not saying a lot of people love it, but it's, it's one of the best exercises for running that puts you in the specific pattern of running, which is and kind of a prerequisite of running, which is marching, marching, skipping, running. That's kind of the sequence that you would progress through here. So biggest thing here, when we look at carry and you kind of wondering, okay, there's three exercises. Do I need to do three for this? No, if you simply go through your, your categories, right? Your, your buckets, carry, um, squat, hinge, push, pull, everything else. If you pick a single exercise for every single one, say you're doing two strength training days um, per week, you pick a single exercise for there. Um, if there's something that's more specific to you, like I really need to work on that. It's a weakness of mine. You can add a second exercise for one of those categories, but simply inputting an exercise from these recommendations into one of those buckets and then executing that program is a very simple way to get on track with your strength training program. Now, as we get into this next one, now we're looking more, I guess you can say more lower body. The carry is still lower body, but this is now from a more strength training standpoint. Um, squat, we all know on the left side, you see a traditional, this is a goblet squat um, done with some type of tempo. So lowering down over three seconds and then driving up strong. Uh, knees out, sitting into the, bending into the knees, sitting back into the hips, but a very knee dominant motion. You'll see the difference between a squat and a hinge. Squat is knee dominant, hinge is hip dominant. And that's how we make sure we target all of these areas around the lower extremity the right way. Um, so with this, right, we start with the squat in its basic form, right? It could even be a body weight squat. It can even be sit to a chair and stand to a chair. It really just depends on what you need, where you're starting from, your injury history, your goals, we progress to a goblet squat. We progress to a back squat or a front squat or add some kind of resistance to that if we need to. And then we can progress to different single leg variations. We have the split squat. Split squat here, you're looking at it thinking that's a lunge, right? It's a, it's a static lunge or a stationary lunge, but in very knee dominant. So I'm bending into that back knee to, drive, to lower down. I'm pushing from that front knee and that front quad to drive back up. And this is just a, a stationary lunge. Reason here, because for the transition between these two, right? Between a squat and a split squat, we look back at the demands of running, right? Squat is great. Uh, could be a good movement to do. Could be something that adds a lot of load. If we add a, a heavy dumbbell, or we had a bar, um, or if we're new to doing squats, right? It's a good exercise that adds a good axial force or compressive force on the body. So it teaches the body how to withstand that as we run and as we pound, as we strike the ground. But over time, we really want to get to some of these single, more single leg or lunge type variations because that's now we have to call on stability, neuromuscular control, balance, pelvic control, making sure the pelvis stays level, foot stability, right? Now we're requiring, requiring a lot of these stabilizers to work a lot harder. So not only are we strengthening muscles, we're calling upon all those other things we mentioned that are required to run and we're putting them in play in a, a single exercise. So we're getting more specific to the demands of running. Lateral squat, this one might throw you off, right? Still a squatting variation, 
but now we're moving laterally to the side. So stationary lateral lunge or static lateral lunge, or whatever you want to call that. I call it the lateral squat. Reason I put this in here is because it depends on where you are with your training program. Running, like I said, is a very predictable movement pattern. You're doing the same thing over and over again for, for mile and mile on end for who knows for days, months, uh, years. So at a certain point, it's actually good to move your body in different planes of motion outside of running. We want to preserve the integrity of our joints, of our tissues, of our muscles and tendons and, and bones and these things. So as people get up to higher mileage, I usually start to switch them away from more sagittal plane movements, like where, where people are almost in a position as if they're just moving naturally in a forward backward position and try to get them to move more laterally or multi-directional. Um, this from an injury reduction standpoint can be very helpful just to not put the same demands on the tissues that it's seeing when you're out there and you're running. And I also have somebody from a flexibility standpoint that has tightness in the hips, uh, has lower back pain, um, has difficulty with different things, knees and all of that, like the lateral squat actually could be a good variation for these people um, to load. This is something you can still, you can add a dumbbell to, um, you can add a bar on your back, you can hold a goblet position bar. There's a lot of different ways you can make this more challenging if you need to, um, but that's just the way we're still respecting the category, but we're figuring out what do we need at that specific point of our training plan and we're inputting the right exercise into that. So there's a lot of options there. Next up, we're looking at hinge. So hinge is a hip dominant movement pattern. So now we're thinking posterior chain, right? Everyone's talking about posterior chain, um, which is awesome. But the from a running standpoint, it's actually the calf, it's the quad, and it's the hip abductors that really work the hardest while running. Um, glute, glute maximus, hip extensors, um, something that's been a buzz more than anything else. Like you look at Instagram, you look at different running magazines and things like that. We really want to make sure calf and quad are strong and, and resilient, able to withstand force. Those are loaded quite a bit. Um, glute is some is, is after that, but these are still great variations to add into your program from a, a basic level here. This is a hip thrust, right? This is something I maybe might not call basic, but if you think of it in its simplest form, this is just a hip bridge or hip lift. So um, something from a PT standpoint, right? Laying on your back, doing a traditional bridge or traditional hip lift um, is something very easy to add in. The hip thrust is a way to add more resistance onto the bar, resistance onto the hip to build more glute, hamstring, and, and posterior chain strength. So very good exercise right there in its simplest form. And as we begin to stand up and load the body to a greater degree with those axial loads, right? The stress coming down and, and compressing the spine, we have Romanian deadlift. You can see here, small bend in the knees, hinging through the hips. You can see the hip thrust, hinging through the hips. Romanian deadlift, hinging through the hips, right? That's where it gets its hinge name. Um, the, the knees aren't really doing too much. The knees are obviously bending slightly, but we're not going into a squat. We're going into a hip hinge. Good posture, postural stabilizers, core, hips, hamstrings, lengthening, um, hip extension as I drive the hips forward to help myself stand up. All of these areas have to work at the same time to complete the Romanian deadlift, but pretty, pretty good exercise, valuable for runners. It really helps more simulate that push off phase of running, right? You're stabilizing everything around the core posture you're maintaining stiffness in those areas to hold without losing your position and, and hunching forward and then you're using the hips to really drive forward to create that that extension now like i said single leg right very uh single leg sport you're on a single leg the majority of the time here so as we get into a a single leg deadlift same thing as the romanian deadlift technically except i'm letting that leg come off the ground and come back so my body and my leg here, almost like staying connected as a unit, small bend in the knees, hinge at the hip, good posture, flat spine, all that stuff staying connected and strong the whole time, but now having to worry about balance and stabilization. So the foot, the knee, the hip, the pelvis, all of these areas need to really work hard to maintain the integrity of this position. If you're someone that has difficulty with balance is the very hard position to get into, right? The single leg, single leg hip hinge. Um, so it can be extremely valuable to improve that. So split squat, single leg deadlift, these are kind of staples within the strength training program for runners to add in that, that single leg stabilization component on top of building good strength. Now, as we get to push and pull, now we're looking a little bit more upper body, uh, which is still important from a running standpoint, because we're now we're, we're getting still getting the core quite a bit, which we haven't talked about 
um, kind of mentioned in various places here. Of course, active in all of these exercises, unless we're sitting on a machine and we're supported. But now as we look at, uh, so Beth says, why is this model wearing, wearing shoes? I'm not even sure who this guy is, actually. I, I picked him out on, on YouTube. He looked like he knew what he was talking about, so I just put the videos in there. But uh, good thing. So what, what Beth is mentioning there, if you look back at some of these, hopefully I can get back. One thing I highly recommend on, truthfully, I, I would do with all strength training just to, we're in shoes so much. Uh, we're in running shoes. We have cushion. We have drop. We have a lot of these different things. We have stability built into some of them. Um, I would recommend when you're doing exercises, remaining deadlift, squat, lateral squat, split squat, single leg deadlift, um, getting out of your shoes a little bit. Um, she, I, I've been working with Beth for a while now, and we, I try to get as many people out of shoes as possible, get them to actually use their foot properly, stabilize, see what that foot is doing on the ground, and to stabilize and really connect it with the floor. So this guy right here, I don't know what he was doing back in. Some of these are back in actually like 2000. Uh, I think that's one of the middles, 2013. So this is all, this is old me right here. This is, this is a baby me. Now, as we look at push, we're looking at upper body kind of pushing away from the ground. So your, your push patterns on the left side, we have high plank, high plank can fit here uh, of regular low plank could fit here because I'm trying to push myself away from the ground and prevent gravity from pulling me down. So it's very simplistic, what uh, very simplistic way high plank and some core exercises could actually start this category so it just depends on kind of where you're at and what you need we can progress there to push-ups right we have an incline push-up here we can go flat push up on the floor we can go decline with the foot up the feet up on a bench and the hands on the floor a lot of different ways to work on the push why i like these and, and typically you'll see me give people planks push-ups those kinds of movement pull-ups a lot of times is because we're trying to find any way to actually use the core to require the core to stabilize in the middle. I don't look at this just as an upper body movement for runners. I actually like this more from a core standpoint because as I'm dynamically moving my shoulders and, and moving through this range of motion, I need to really lock in my core, make sure I'm staying stable and strong hips, core, spine, all of that to move the body as a unit. So I give quite a, pe quite a few people incline pushups and have them progress through just because it ends up being a dynamic plane where we get upper body strength as a, as a side effect, right? Because both of that will improve your running as well. These first two are more horizontal pushes. This last one here is a vertical push. So if we just look at a standard overhead press, then you can see, um, like if you went to the gym and, and sat on the machine, you can do shoulder press just sitting there on a machine and strengthen your shoulders. That's good and fine if you want to build shoulder strength. In this tall kneeling position though, I'm forcing myself to drive the hips forward. <sighs> Exhale, pull the rib cage down, creating a good vertical position from the knees, the hips and the shoulders. So all of this is stabilizing at the same time. And then I'm strengthening my shoulders. So you'll see when I create these programs for people, yes, they include upper body, but they're always taken into consideration. What else do I want to get from this, from this situation? This person's working hard. I don't want them just to build shoulder strength to build shoulder strength. That's great. But I want them to build shoulder strength, core stability, get the glutes and the hips engaged, put them in a position where multiple things have to work at the same time. Okay. So these are your pulls. You have horizontal or pushes, sorry horizontal push. And then we have our vertical push going overhead, just different directions that we're actually pushing away from the body. Now, from a pull standpoint, this is, in my opinion, more important from an upper body standpoint um, than the push category, because we're thinking now more so these postural muscles of the upper and mid back, right? Your rhomboids, your trap, um, those muscles that really help keep your shoulders back. I'm sitting here hunching forward right now, not a good example, but your shoulders are back and you're in a good position where you're not losing your posture as you run, as you pound, as you get to the later stages of the race and you fatigue and your arms are swinging, the more you start to lose posture and round forward, the more it starts to affect your lower body mechanics. So we can build good strength and control around those shoulder blades and posture muscles of the upper back, the better we can stay in a good position throughout that race. Seated low row here is really the, the, the easiest way to set up in this category. Obviously, all of the weight is trying to pull my body forward. So every muscle along the back of the spine there is trying to keep me back at that slight angle. At the same time, tall spine, 
elbows come back, engage the shoulder blades together. So getting that, um, getting the traps, getting the rhomboids there between the shoulder blades, very good, simple postural exercise for the back, but still also getting the core because I'm unsupported. Then as we start to progress that kind of combining more of that hinge pattern here with the pull, right? The bent over row, small bend in the knees, hinge at the hips, back is nice and flat. And as I come back and row with that arm, my elbow is driving back past the body and I'm engaging through these, these posterior chain muscles of the mid and upper back. So first two here are horizontal, right? Horizontal pulling motions. Here is more of a vertical. I'm going from high to low now. So this is a lat pull down. So what changes here as you, as you actually alter your angle of some of these motions is um, we're getting different muscles to contribute to a different degree. So here we're getting more of the lats, more of the lower trap. Here we're getting mid upper trap rhomboids. They're all working in all of these exercises, but we're just, we're just kind of varying that to a degree. So it might depend during the person. Some people that come in that sit at the desk all day and they're up in this position. I might actually want to pick more of these vertical ones to get them to actually activate those lower traps and lats to pull those shoulders down into better posture, right? This is where we use the evaluation to dictate which exercise we want to decide. Also in this category could be pull-ups, um, could be regular lat pull down with the bar, right? There's a lot of different exercises we can put into that pull, get, pull category, but anything from a really a postural standpoint to help really reinforce those shoulders being back in a nice, strong upper and mid back. Now this everything else category, this is where, uh, this is, this is what I like. I, I like this category because it, it gives you a lot of the way to think, okay, what else does this person need? What else do I need in order to be successful? Um, we have our five things there, right? We have our carry, we had our squat, we had our hinge, we had our push and our pull, but now how do we round that out the right way that helps this person really see good good results from a strength training standpoint. And then what else are they missing potentially, right? Are they, are they neglecting any muscle groups or areas? How's their running go? What does their, their, their past medical history look like? They have a history of injuries, the Achilles or the, the knee and patellar tendon or bone stress injuries at the metatarsals or, or, or fibula, um, anything like that, femur. So we can look at those things and really decide what else do we need to supplement within the program? And this is where that everything else category really comes in. My recommendation is always calf and single leg stabilization. The calf is one of those areas, and we're not talking about the bigger outermost calf muscle, we're talking about the deeper down soleus muscle. There's a couple muscles in the calf there, is targeting the calf because like I mentioned before, the calf is, is one of the most active muscles as we run. So we really wanna make sure we strengthen the calves as much as possible. A lot of times, and in, in what I've seen recently is people are focusing so much on on hips, which is great, right? It's, a, it's, it's an important area of the body, but the calf is actually what they call the powerhouse for runners. So making sure you have the right calf strengthening, and I'll, and I'll show you one in a second. Single leg stabilization with all that force coming down on a single leg, I really want to make sure you're strong. You can control your body weight on a single leg. If you're someone that traditionally does regular squats on two legs, uh, we always wonder, okay, you do squats on two legs, then you land with potentially two to six times your body weight on one leg, how well does our body do absorbing that type of force, right? It's a lot more force if we, if we did the math out there on a single leg. So single leg stabilization would be my next thing. And then we start to layer in some of these other pieces here, locomotion drills. Those are things I add into the strength training program, usually as a dynamic warm up or as a power drill that those are things like your, your skipping, um, your, your low skips, your A skips, your B skips, your karaoke, your, lateral straight leg bounds, right? There's the backward walking. There's a lot of things we actually layer into the strength training program that you wouldn't think is strength training, but could fit well within this category. Plyometrics is also important. If we're talking about being powerful and pushing off a single leg um, in someone that has maybe a past bone stress injury, and we want to load that bone in a healthy way, in a strategic way, it needs to be smart to build bone density. So there's not a recurring issue since and bone stress injuries are very likely with running, um, adding plyometrics or some type of jumping and landing, landing drill in there could be helpful. Core stabilization. If you are doing the exercises that I showed before, right? All of these other upright and, and dynamic exercises, your split squats, your single leg deadlifts, your hip thrusts and those things, you're technically getting the core in most of those. Um, I tend not to add a lot more core into it 
but it's the most requested area for most people. Uh, people associate the core with, hey, I feel like I'm getting some weight in that area. Can we add more core exercises to combat that? Like, yes, nutrition will do that, right? Are you going to fix that in the kitchen? Core is not really necessarily going to do that. We have a core. It's, it's there somewhere. Um, but we can add more core stabilization as well within this category and then also address anything physique specific. So a lot of my runners, they're also regular people, right? Their job is not just to run. It's to feel good and to be confident and move well and, and be proud of themselves. So we might throw in an arm exercise or an ab exercise or a glute, right? We throw in those things just to make sure we round, round up the, pro, the program and give the person what's, what they want to be happy and to target the areas that they think are beneficial for them. So these are the different pieces that we like to layer in there. And I like to really use this to create the most alignment toward the end goal to make sure we're rounding out the program the best way to see good success. Now, if we look at some exercises, I'm going to talk about the top three. So calf complex, my favorite one is the soleus wall sit. Um, everyone loves, loves wall sits. We remember holding these uh, back in the day, but getting in that low wall sit position and all you're going to do is just elevate the heels off the ground. Um, this right here, because the knees are bent, if we think of a traditional calf raise when your legs are straight and you're elevating, lifting the heel, that's more that outer gastroc muscle of the calf. If we bend the knees, now we're getting that deeper soleus muscle that I referenced was the powerhouse for runners. So that's the difference of knowing running, knowing joints, knowing anatomy and physiology and tweaking an exercise to better fit the end result, right? Um, if this is someone that was training for a bodybuilding competition, right. Or, a, a, a physique competition, the soleus muscle, you can't really see it's deeper down. We might do the other form of calf raises because it's more specific to, to what that person needs core stabilization. Let's see question here, Tammy. Yes. Add those back in, please add those, <laughs> but, um, core stabilization. Um, this right here is the stability ball, dead bug. If you're laying on your back here, right? Traditional dead bug without the ball, opposite arm and opposite leg move as your core stabilizes the spine, the pelvis and the hip. So we're trying to make sure as we move the arm and the leg, we're not getting any excess arching at the lower back. So you shouldn't see the space increase as I do the dead bug. With the ball in there, I'm pulling with the hands and the knees together, which actually starts to contract the abdominals more. So I'm getting more engagement through abdominals, challenging core stability to a greater degree is a pretty good burn on this one from a, from a core, uh, core standpoint. But I think big thing, if we talk about that for a second is a lot of people doing sit-ups, doing crunches, doing all of those, which, and it's fine if you want to do those, um, specificities to running is much lower spine doesn't move a whole lot core doesn't move a whole lot as you run we have a small amount of rotation side to side we more so want our rib cage to sit on top of our pelvis we don't want we don't need all this excess crunching flexions um, do i still add it in for people yes people like that so i'll still do that to a degree but i try to learn as much stability work as possible because that really helps stabilize the spine the rib cage the pelvis that helps improve running performance to a greater degree then third one here, we have our single leg. Um, single leg squat is really hitting everything. It's quad, it's hip adductors, it's glutes, it's uh, pelvic control, foot stability, right? It, it's doing everything. This is a single leg sit to stand where I'm simply just slowly sitting down to the bench and then driving back up. So it's giving me that kind of little catch at the bottom to make sure I'm in a good position. And then coming, I can add more weight to this. I can get rid of the bench. I could progress this at a vest on. Um, so my clients add vest on and we load this up to a greater degree, right? We can, we can make this more challenging, but this is a great single leg exercise, usually something I progress to. So out of everything I showed you today, this would probably be the one I would say, don't rush and do immediately. Perfect the other ones first, the split squat, the single leg, um, single leg deadlift and those ones and make this something you work towards and it's pretty challenging exercise. So good question, Vicki, how high do you lift your heels in the soleus wall sit? And actually, I was thinking about that as I was watching this. This is, this is a video I did years ago. That's high. That's really high. Um, if you go too high on the soleus wall sit and you're elevating the heels, you're actually going to really overly shorten that, that soleus muscle and you could get some cramping in there. Um, usually about two to three inches off the ground is all you want. So it's a lot lower than you think it needs to be. And that is actually more specific to what is needed while running. So it doesn't have to be as high as possible just to be as high as possible. Um, usually we want to be more specific and this video actually is not a good, not a good representation of that. So that's a pretty good, pretty good question right there. 
Now, as we finish that content here, let's run through a quick little uh, quiz again, one last time, and we'll start to wrap up here, kind of get to a wrap up page and, and we'll enter, the, enter into the raffle to see who, who's going to be the lucky winner there of that program. So next poll, blank is not one of the six foundational movement patterns. Is it squat, pull, hinge, or single leg? I may have confused you a second ago, which I tried to do. Um, so hopefully this one's a little bit more challenging than it should be because I just uh, said something that might throw you off. Most runners are neglecting which movement pattern is that carry, hinge, push, or pull. And then the everything else category is where you create the most alignment between your needs, the demands of support, and the goals. Is that true or false? Take a second, answer these. Looking good so far, looking good. Let's see who's eating dinner as they're watching this. Who's paying attention? Who's watching? Jeopardy, let's see. <laughs> we have 75% entered. We're gonna wait till we get 80 here before we close the poll. So we got 81. I'm gonna give you two seconds for one more person to chime in. Who's still thinking right now? And they're still thinking, so I'm going to cut it off. There we go. Perfect. All right, guys. So just a quick review of the results. Blank is not one of the six foundational movement patterns. It's actually single leg, right? Single leg is in the everything else category. It could be in the squat, right? You can do a single leg squat. You can do a split squat. It's still in that to a degree, but it's not the category itself. You can do a single leg deadlift, but it's not a, uh, a hinge category. So that one's a little bit deceiving. Most runners are neglecting which movement pattern. That was carry. So this one, again, you can see the, the range there of, of answers. It was carry. Most people are not doing any type of loaded carry, the farmer walk, the suitcase carry, or the two dumbbell marching. So that would be a good place, a low-hanging fruit for, for all of you if you're not doing it. Um, great exercise. Last one, true. Nice job. Nice job. All right, guys. So let's begin to wrap up here. Now, how to best move forward with this information. Like Dan Judd said, it, I said it was simple, not easy. So I showed you six different categories. You can obviously add one or two to some of these categories if you need to. You don't need a whole lot of exercises. I think we usually do too much. Um, it's simple. It's a very simple system. It's a very simple process. You just need to individualize it to your needs as much as possible. It's where people are going wrong is, is not aligning it with their running plan. Um, not doing a running analysis and an evaluation to understand what exercises best fit them. You just, if you stay too general, you'll still see results to a degree. You can improve balance, improve strength. Are you improving things that you need to improve? Uh, it's not easy, the pro the, this process, because it takes sweat. It takes hard work. It takes consistency over a long period of time. Um, most people, the ones that I see that are the most successful, I usually have a good in six plus months with them, you can still see results in, in two, three months. You can get on track, improve alignment with your program, but it takes time of consistently turning the dials and tweaking things and, and getting better, making it fit alongside your running as your plan running builds up and backs down and prepares you for your goal races. So it's not easy, but the process is very simple. Now use these six funda foundational, um, foundational movement patterns as categories to individualize to your needs. So uh, you have your carry, you have your squat, you have your hinge, you have your push, your pull, your everything else. Write down on a piece of paper, every single one of those categories, select an exercise for each category, right? If you have questions, you want to reach out to me. We need to do an evaluation. We need to figure out what you need. We can individualize the exercises within that category. Use the system and then individualize the system. So I think it's good to look at what you're doing currently right now and see what bucket it fits into. Um, within each bucket, bucket being as consistent as you need and really respecting your running uh, would be helpful. Following a periodized model, and this kind of goes back to, like I said, respecting your running, you want to make sure running, if your goal is to become a better running runner, runner running is the priority, right? So as you build up your mileage, your strength training starts to back down. As you finish that goal race and your running mileage backs down, then as you recover after that goal race, you might have some, some low key time for maybe who knows, four, eight weeks, whatever, until you get into your next structured training plan, hit that strength training hard. So that might be a time where you could do strength training for three days a week. You might pick six exercises to 10 exercises that fit into these categories and you hit it hard. 
And then as you get back into your training plan and get ready for your next race, maybe you back down to one to two strength training days and you consistently go through this process. Over time, you always end up ahead. The people that I see that continuously uh, struggle, either doing the same amount of strength training, it's too intense for their needs to fit alongside their training. Um, it's not specific to their needs. It never changes. They're not respecting their running plan. And they're just doing that throughout the entire year. Um, the program has to adapt based on your running. And that's what a periodized model does. It allows you to peak at the right time for your goal race, as opposed to just do everything and, and hope for something. And then Join the program, right? We'll raffle off one uh, spot right now here. If you're someone that's thinking at this point, like individualizing this to your needs, doing it within a fun program where you can win prizes, interact with other runners and, and have some fun as you do it. Um, this would definitely be a, a great fit for you. So if you're interested in entering into the raffle, I highly recommend entering. Let's see, let me get that poll up. All you need to do here, and this is just going to um, submit things into my end. So, so you know how my system works. Uh, what this will do is add you into my system. So as I check and I go through and I, and I randomly draw the people that are uh, interested in the program tomorrow and I'm able to select through like random draw who the winner is, um, I can see all those people on my end and I'll, I'll share that in the email tomorrow. So what this program will help you do can eliminate all the guesswork. I think a lot of people are still are, are doing things, but not the right things. So how do you get on track with the right program for you um, to be specific, to see results, to fit alongside your running, uh, address past injuries, address risk factors to injury so we can reduce the likelihood of injury. We're not going to eliminate it, but we're going to reduce the likelihood moving forward because we're on top of the right things. Um, you can add on with this program if you want running analysis, one-on-one -on -one sessions, a custom running plan, right? You can get as specific as you need. I'm going to wait one second here. We have 82% just to let one more person get in. Perfect. We'll end that poll right there. If you didn't get in, sorry, you can message me and I can add you into that. Um, if you are not the lucky winner, this program is only open to 10 people. I'm limiting the numbers of all these programs moving forward just because, again, the more interaction I can provide you, the better results you will see. I don't, don't want or need a lot of people in these programs at this time, so really trying to get specific and, and help out the select few people I can help. Um, here is the link right here. I just sent that in the chat. Take a look at the program, see if that's something that fits your needs. Um, again, it's completely individualized, regardless of when your races are, what you're working on, what your goals are, like everything will be custom to, to, to you and your needs. Um, so take a look at that program, see if it's something that works for you. We would love to have you in it. And now, I appreciate you guys joining me on the webinar today. Um, tomorrow at 11 a.m., expect an email from me. Um, you're coming from my, my, my newsletter software, so you need to make sure you check your um, check your spam folder as it sometimes ends up in there. Webinar replay, it will have the raffle winner, um, have some information on the fundamentals of strength training program. Also over the next couple of days, I wanted to make sure, cause there were actually a few other pieces that I wanted to include in the webinar, but I didn't want to go too long. Like this is perfect. 50 minutes is good to get you guys on with your night. So I'm going to send you a video Saturday at 11 AM. It's three ways runners self-sabotage their running. And then a video on Sunday at 11 AM, how to get more with less. These videos, I think if you watch those and dig into those, they're, I think they're about five to six minutes long. Um, but they'll really help you understand a little bit more behind the scenes with some of these things, maybe some areas that some things that you're doing right now that are actually ruining your results or really working against you, which I see a lot of the time. Um, and then how do you actually do less work and get more results? Uh, to me, that's the key to most of this, especially from an endurance in an endurance sport, right? You're working so hard, you're putting in the miles. Um, if we can do less and get more, there's a, a less likelihood of injury. And that's something we should all, all really be after. So check through your email tomorrow, next couple of days, I'll send those over to you. If you have questions on the program, you're welcome to reach out directly. Thanks, Beth. I appreciate you joining. If anyone else has... Thanks, Jessica. <laughs> if anyone has questions, ask away here. I'm going to hang out for the next three to four minutes, answer any questions that, uh, that come up. Feel free to drop that in the Q&A. There should be a Q&A button on your screen if there's anything that you're thinking, wondering. Thanks, Yvonne. Hope you're doing well. I was just looking at my lucky Irish, Irish coin upstairs a couple minutes ago before I started this. Thanks, Vicky. Thanks for joining this evening from Florida. Probably sitting on the beach right now, making us uh, feel bad because it was just just snowing out here a second ago. Uh, any questions here as we wrap up? 
welcome to reach out at any point. Always available to chat, discuss, talk about things. Because want to make sure you guys are on track and getting results. All right, guys. Thank you. Hope you have a great uh, Thursday evening and rest of your weekend. Thanks, Nicolette. Hope you're doing well. Jen, like the equation for a strength training program. Yes, one each of the six. It's a way simple, I think, simple and to the point, and then just customizing to your needs. Uh, again, sometimes that simplicity is what we need, right, to see good results. So, all right, guys, thank you. Hope you have a good uh, Thursday night and rest of your week, and I will talk to you soon. Thanks.